All right, here we go. This video is brought to you by Matter Hackers and Piopoli's Moai 200. Hey there, fellow maker. Welcome to the shop. You've got build today and also a really cool project with a really cool 3D printer. Our friends over at Matter Hackers and Piopoli teamed up with us so that we could show you a project on the newer Moai 200 SLA 3D printer. It's an SLA machine, which means it does high detail very well and it's a much larger print volume than a lot more of the uh, other SLA printers out there. So we were excited to get a chance to do a prop that is super detailed and larger than most uh, 3D printed props. And I went with uh, a dagger from Apex Legends, a new game that's out. Jury over at the 3D Workbench put together a file for it, so I bought it from his Etsy store. We'll have a link down below if you want to grab one for yourself. And we figured, let's give it a shot and see if we can print this whole 12 inch long dagger all in one go on the Moai 200. Let's do it. I loaded up the model of the dagger in Moai's Asura slicer. This is to prepare it for printing. I got it rotated in place so that it fit perfectly inside of the print volume. And I added supports. I exported my G-code and put it into the Moai 200 for printing and hit go. When the print finished up about 14 hours later, I pulled the print bed off of the printer so that I could get at the print. And then I used a chisel to very carefully pry the supports off of the printing surface so that I could get the whole dagger off and start working on it. The first thing I wanted to do was to remove all of that support material. I tried to be careful to not chip into the printed surface that I wanted to keep on the dagger. I used some flush cutters and brute force to snap away all of that support material. When the prints come off the print bed, they have a fine coating of some of the liquid resin still on them. It needs to be cleaned off and I used 70% isopropyl alcohol. I found that 99% was too strong. 70 worked really well. I could submerge the part in a bath of that alcohol and using a soft toothbrush, scrub away at the surface to remove any remaining resin. Once I was pretty sure I got all the resin off, I gave it a quick rinse in water, again using that toothbrush just to scrub away any remaining resin. SLA prints like this need to be finished off with some ultraviolet light. It was recommended that I submerge the part in water and then shine a UV light on it. So I put it in a bath of water, turned on my UV light and let it bathe in that warming glow for 10 minutes before flipping it over and baking the other side. Once the dagger was fully cured, I pulled it out of the water and I used compressed air to blow it all off and make sure that everything on it was fully cured. And then we could get to work on finishing it. Ooh. This thing looks really great. A uh, couple of notes. I printed it with um, the flat side of it facing towards the build surface. I figured having a lot of surface area so that the supports would have something to grab onto would help. Uh, although I think perhaps if I had done it perfectly vertically, like so, I could have had the supports all along this edge and not had them touch down on this surface. Because uh, I will have to clean that up a little bit. So if I were to do this again, I'd probably try and print it like that. But other than that, everything turned out really well. And I'm excited to dive in and start cleaning this up so that we can get ready to make our fully finished prop. This is the side of the dagger that did not have support material on it, and I am blown away by the detail. Look at that. I challenge an FDM printer to get this kind of super fine detail. Check out this text, too. It's about a millimeter deep. It's super, super clean and crisp. Uh, I'm very excited that I, I won't have to sand in and around here. My mind's already racing with other project ideas for this printer. The, this level of detail and then a whole, like a 12 inch long prop all in one print is pretty uh, exciting to think about. Actually, I imagine you've got some ideas. If you do have an idea of a prop you 3D print on this printer and get all this kind of detail, 
what would you pick? What would you print on a printer this big with this kind of detail? Let me know down in the comments, in fact, because I'd love to get some more ideas. The first thing I'll do is use these flush cutters to go in and trim off any remaining little nubs that were left from the supports. Uh, you gotta be careful though, it's possible to accidentally snap it off and leave a little indent, like I did right there. That'll have to be filled in later. So you do wanna be careful with the flush cutter uh, that you don't snap it. This stuff is quite brittle. Uh, but I can remove most of the support material, or what's left of it anyway, with my flush cutters, and then I don't have to sand all that off later. So I'm just gonna go over this thing and do a little bit of cleanup. Now that I've removed the bulk of these support spots here, I'm gonna use just a uh, nail file to go in and, and remove the rest of them. And then this bevel here should be pretty smooth, so I'm gonna take the opportunity to kinda level everything out a little bit. The opposite side is pretty much good to go. I'm probably gonna prime and sand that once. Uh, this side needs a tiny bit more work. One of the nice things about this type of SLA printer uh, resin is that when it's fully cured, it's really nice to sand. It's uh, a lot nicer than like, um, like if you're trying to sand a PLA print off of an FDM printer. Uh, this is much nicer than that. It, it's, it's rigid so it doesn't gum up the way that um, other materials might. This whole thing's gonna get sanded as smooth as possible. I am planning on making a mold of it. So I wanna make sure that the mold is nice and clean. Not all the high spots cleaned up here, uh, but these low spots, especially in some of the detail areas, are gonna require a little more fine detail. I can't quite get my big stubby sanding tools in there. So I've got this round diamond grinding bit on my rotary tool and I can use it to just knock those back a bit. And then I can just kind of feel and see if it's smooth enough for my purposes. I will have to come back in and sand that a little bit, but that should get the surface pretty flush. Try not to go too deep. I don't want to have to fill in if I can avoid it. We've got all of those blemishes knocked down a bit and now I have some 400 grit sandpaper and I'm trying to just level out all of these surfaces, especially just anywhere that I use that rotary tool. I just wanna make sure that spot ends up being as flat as possible. Um, this will also reveal wherever there is a small divot that needs to be filled in. This spot of white is actually a low spot that's filled in with dust. Um, I will have to fill that, same thing with this spot over here. Uh, but I'm gonna sand everything flat and then hit this with air to knock all of that out and then hit it with primer and then any of those low spots will be very obvious and we can use a tiny amount of filler to clean that up. Uh, but I'm just gonna keep going with my sandpaper until this low area is nice and smooth. I just did a quick pass of sanding. Everything's looking pretty good but I do wanna hit this with primer just so I can double check that everything looks great. Uh, I do know there's a couple of small spots I will have to fill. I can hit this with compressed air, get all that dust out of the details because I wanna make sure that the uh, spray paint primer I put on there will have something to stick to. We don't want big clumps of uh, resin, or uh, resin dust anyway. Getting in our way. To really make sure it's nice and clean, I can wipe the whole thing down with alcohol. And just like when I um, cleaned the print out of the uh, print bed, I'm using 70% or not 99%. We want a slightly gentler alcohol so we don't gum up the resin surface. But that really does a good job of picking up any remaining dust so that now we can hit this with some primer. Left the primer to dry for about, uh, I don't know, half an hour. And now we can very clearly see the low spots, just little divots from the support material that I can fill in. I'm gonna do this filling before I do any sort of sanding, because I will have to sand this filler. So I can do that at the same time, once that's dried. But that's really all I need. I don't wanna overdo it, because that means more sanding for me later. So I'm just gonna go around, fill in a couple of these little spots. I waited about another half hour for my uh, filler to dry and it seems like it's fully dry so I can go in with my 400 grit sandpaper and sand it nice and smooth. And uh, I wanna make sure that I'm not making a divot so I'm going across it 
in some nice wide strokes there. And there should be just a little bit of green left in there where it's filling the hole. That's the goal. So I can go over all these little parts that I filled earlier. Let's see them nice and smooth. Got all my spots smoothed out pretty well. I'm just kind of giving everything a bit of a buff with this scouring pad. I do think I want to hit this with one more round of primer, but before I do that, I do want to do a little bit of sanding on the other side. I've already started, really just to make sure it's as smooth as possible. So some of this edge here to get rid of that tiny bit of texture. I've got some 220 and then we'll go to 400 and then eventually the scouring pad to kind of smooth everything out before one more round of priming. That'll do it for this round. Um, I think I'm gonna just dust this off and hit it with another uh, layer of primer just so we can double check that everything looks really good and then we can get on to mold making. While the primer's drying on my dagger, I'm gonna set up my mold box. This will hold all the silicone around the dagger while we're pouring it. And normally I would take the time, get some clay and do a two part mold for a dagger like this. But sometimes you don't have all that time. Sometimes you only have let's say 24 hours to get a casting out. So I'm gonna show you how I would do a dagger like this as a one part mold. It means we're gonna to have to cut the mold apart later, which should be very exciting. Uh, to get started, I built a little base out of some scrap uh, plywood here, drove a couple screws through it, and that's what's gonna support our dagger. I happen to have a spare print right here. That's gonna support it and hold it upright when we fill this box that I'm about to build with silicone. Uh, that box is going to be made out of this scrap chloroplast plastic. This is like the sign making stuff you'd get at the uh, hardware store. I'm going to use this because I have a bunch of it from a leftover project. Uh, and this will make the box around which we will pour our mold. This is, of course, just a temporary box. So I'm just going to tape it all together using duct tape. And then later we can tear it apart. This kind of goes like that. And then this one, I think I designed it to go on the outside. Pretty sure that's how I did it. So that this will fit inside of it like that. Go like this. Like that. A little bit of cleanup, but we got ourselves a little rectangular box. The idea is our dagger will be attached to those screws and then this will go over it to contain our silicone. And we can just fill it right up. I gave the prime twice primed dagger another buffing with some uh, scouring pad there. And now it's time to set it up for molding and it's got to go on this fella. So I need to drill some holes at the bottom of it very carefully. I've marked out where I want to drill the holes. Now this resin is super brittle and I want to be really careful not to have it just explode. <laughs> when I try and drill a hole. So I'm gonna drill a pilot hole with a smaller drill bit first and then I'm gonna come in with a bigger guy after. I also wanna make sure I don't drive all the way through into this, this empty cavity here, so. Kinda of got it started and now I wanna not go that way, I want it to go that way. See if I can drill that out to the bigger hole without again exploding it. Yeah, it's kind of crunchy. Now, if this gets kind of mangled, it's not the end of the world. This is gonna be the pouring spout eventually. So this will all be part of the sprue. I just need to make sure it doesn't blow up and ruin any parts that we wanna keep. So that will go on like that. All right, these two things are gonna go on there. Although I do need these to go down a little further so we have more room in our mold box. So I think I'm just gonna cut these shorter. I can't really drill these any deeper. There isn't enough material left. That fits on there still, and it should be tall enough for our box. So I can glue this on. I'm just gonna tack it down with hot glue. This just needs to hold it in place while the silicone cures. It doesn't need to be pretty or structurally sound. It just needs to help out for a little while. Do wanna kind of make sure that it's mostly upright. Now it's time to attach our box. So it should fit over here perfectly. And it does. Uh, now I can just hot glue the box to the piece of wood and we're pretty well set. 
I do have the ability to wiggle this a little bit and make sure the dagger is centered in the mold. So I can put on my hot glue and then take a peek down there and nudge this a little bit to get everything kind of centered. I wanna make sure that the dagger is centered this way. I don't want the mold box too close to one side or the other. Time to mix up my silicone. I did some math the volume of that box is about 750 milliliters, and I'm estimating the dagger is about 100. So I'm gonna mix up about 650 milliliters of silicone. That should be pretty close. It's a one to 10 ratio, so it's 777 grams of silicone. I need 77 grams of side B. Did I say 77, is that what I said? That's how much it should be, 77. All I have to do now is mix this all together. Now you might be asking yourself, Bill, you've already 3D printed the prop. Why are you going through the added expense and time of making a mold? Well, there's a lot of reasons why. If I wanted to make more than one of these daggers, a mold would allow me to cast multiple copies much quicker and cheaper than just continuing to print them. But also that type of SLA resin is extremely uh, brittle, not just working with it, but if you were to say, make your prop out of that and then you bring it to a convention and drop it on a hard floor, well, this is what would happen. All right, here we go. There we go. The urethane resin castings that we're gonna get out of this mold, however, should be far more durable and a lot better uh, at being dropped. Also, if we have a mold, we can cast the uh, dagger in a wide variety of materials and colors and transparencies. Just gives us a lot more options, it gives us room to experiment, especially once we have the mold made. Uh, I'm gonna dump this into another bucket and scrape the sides to make sure that it's all nice and integrated. There's still plenty of unmixed silicone in there. There we go, one more mix and then we'll vacuum degas this guy and then pour our mold. In you go. Our uh, silicone, when we mix it, we introduce a whole lot of air bubbles. So we're using this vacuum chamber to pull as many of those bubbles out as we can. We also wanna make sure it doesn't overflow. Oh my goodness. Go down, down, down. All right. We'll leave it going for about a minute and then we should be all set. Here we go. Some nice, fresh silicone. I set my piece down a little lower so it's easier to pour in there and then I'm gonna try and pour a nice thin stream all the way to the bottom and then let it fill up. I wanna try and not hit the piece. I wanna try and go all the way down to the bottom if I can. Not always possible. But uh, yeah, just gonna do this for a while. I'm using Molmax 30 here. It's a pretty normal silicone, uh, but it's tin cure. I went for this instead of a platinum cure silicone because this kind of 3D printer resin, if any of it isn't fully cured, it will cause the platinum silicone to uh, not cure, which is very sad. <laughs> so uh, this stuff, the Moldax 30s tin cure, and it will cure under almost any condition. So we should be all set. The similar silicone is called 29NV, uh, something else that SmoothOn makes. It's very similar to this, but it's a thinner viscosity, so you don't need to use your vacuum chamber, or if you don't have a vacuum chamber. <laughs> Hence the NV, no vacuum. While I'm doing this for a while, I thought I'd take a moment to thank the members of our Extra Credit Club. Those of you who are members here on YouTube or over on Patreon, your support has not gone unnoticed. Thank you so much. Uh, if you haven't already jumped in on the Extra Credit Club, you can join a number of ways. We've got a website for it over on punishprops.com. You can get access to uh, weekly behind the scenes vlogs that we do here. We also do an extra build discussion video for every one of our videos. 
Uh, and also, our build videos that come out on Monday, if you're a member of the Extra Credit Club, you can watch those on Friday. Well, the Friday before, not the Friday after. You can watch it then if you want to, that's fine. Anyway, uh, link down in the description uh, to where you can go to find out everything you need to know about the Extra Credit Club. And I thank you for your support. It means a lot. I was pouring that in there and it's a lot lower than I thought it would be. And then I looked at the side and noticed that it's bulging quite a lot. Um, if I were to pull this, push this in, you can see it's gonna fill up a lot more. So I'm gonna just, th this chloroplast is just a little too flexible. I should've used something more rigid. So I'm gonna just sandwich some pieces of wood on the outside of this to keep it nice and flat. That's better, I hope. Okay, cool. I can continue to fill it up. Just using the last bit of the silicone here and it might be enough. Hopefully it's enough. I don't wanna have to mix more of this stuff. That is a tiny leak. You can see when I wipe that away, it starts to pour out again. So I just got some clay. This is just plastilina clay that I use for my molds. And I'm just gonna mash that over that spot and plug the leak. There we go. This isn't the prettiest mold I've made, but it's one of the fastest. Um, we have to let this cure and it's, boy, pretty close to beer o'clock. So I'm gonna head home and let this thing cure overnight. It is cured. Sometimes, whether it's intentional or not, you have to cut apart a silicone mold. To do that, you need, um, well, you need some tools for that, and I've got them right here. For a lot of the cutting, I'll use this really thin scalpel so I can sneak it in between the halves of the mold that I'm cutting apart. Uh, but the most important one is this knife, which I made myself, and that's a mold knife. You can buy these or you can modify an X-Acto knife like I've done to uh, make it wavy so that when you cut a piece of silicone, like so, it leaves registration so it wants to stay together. Now this blade uh, is one I made myself and I'll show you how I made it. The first and important thing, most important thing, is that these blades are hardened steel so if you try and bend them like so, point it away from my face, they'll snap. And that's not what we want so we have to heat them up first. Now I usually use a blowtorch but I'm gonna see if I can do it with this lighter. We just need to heat it up so that it's red hot and then it will be soft enough for us to manipulate. The thing to remember about this annealing is that it's permanent. This uh, metal, and unless you go back and harden it again, it will stay soft. So we can get our blade bent to the shape that we want but it will be soft. So it's an important thing to remember. Let's see if that's soft enough now to bend it without breaking. I'm just gonna hit it with a blowtorch just to be a little quicker. There we go. Now that's really hot, make sure we don't touch it. I should be able to bend a little loop in it there. So we just want like this little indent, just like so. And then kinda bring it back and level out the tip of the blade. Now remember, this is still hot, you don't wanna to touch it. But now there's that loop in there so that again, when I cut my silicone, I'll end up with that indent. This is the old blade that I'm replacing. You can see just how easy it is to bend, especially that tip, and that, that'll end up wearing out over time. So I can swap that out for my new one, which has cooled down now, and then we can give it a shot and see how well it works. That's exactly what we want. We have that nice registration now. And this will cut along the seam and you can turn it as you go if you wanna create some extra registration like that. So now you have this groove in there and when the two halves of the mold come together, they will seat pretty well together, pretty well. All right, let's go cut apart our mold. Okay, we can take our improvised mold walls off. It looks like it came out okay. I think I want to try and unscrew the bottoms. Um, those go into our dagger. Now it may crack the model on the way out, I'm not sure, but we have our mold made so we should be all right. Let me get a screwdriver. Here's hoping. Well, it's spinning loose, that's good, and it's coming out. All right. Wow, that was a lot faster. Out with you. Just gonna trim away the uh, Hot glue, that should be the only thing holding this together, I hope. You know what? 
I'm gonna carve the uh, box open. I think that'll that'll help us. Uh, something I did not foresee using this chloroplast, which again I would recommend not using, is that the silicone actually snuck under and started seeping up into the walls. Uh, it may be hard to see on camera, but the silicone is filled up to about here, which meant I kept having to pour more silicone in the top of it to top it off, but I got it to work. Again, this is not recommended. <laughs> I usually use like a stiffer plastic foam core is pretty good. Um, sometimes you have to reinforce it though, but like it's hard to go wrong with half inch plywood. <laughs> Got my own Zoidberg costume. Now I can go around and clean up these edges so my mold looks all pretty. I can go away. This is our block of silicone and the dagger is suspended in the middle of it and about that orientation. I'll have to cut a sprue on the end of here for pouring it, but first I'm gonna cut a seam down the side and I'm just gonna do it down one side. I don't need to cut this totally apart. I'll start by cutting a line down the middle on one side and on the top here, but I'm, I'm gonna cut it kind of wavy. I'll, I'll show you. So I'm kinda going back and forth as I cut. The tip is kind of on the same axis, but as I go down the side, you can see I'm being kind of wavy. This isn't all the way down to our part yet, but that's gonna help us with a little bit of registration. Now you, even if you don't have a mold cutting knife, or if you didn't make one, you could cut apart the mold like this with just an X-Acto knife if you needed to. And just as you cut, you add more and more layers of registration and just start working your way down until you hit your model. As it gets closer to the model though, that's when I'll grab my curvy knife here and try and get the tip of it, that very tip to just graze the surface of the uh, model. It does take a bit of patience to get this to work really well. However, it's a lot quicker to do it this way than to do a full on two part mold. Uh, you have to clay up half of the mold and then pour half of your silicone and then let it cure overnight and then do the same thing on the other side the next day. This cuts out a whole day worth of work. Slow and steady, I'm trying to cut this so that the seam ends up on the edge of the dagger blade. It's not the end of the world if it doesn't, but that could help us have a much cleaner casting. Half of our mold is open now. We should be able to get the dagger out, except for one very important thing. There are a couple of parts where the silicone passed all the way through, so those have to be cut as well. So I'm just gonna pull them out and trim like so. And those should lock back together again once we uh, have to do our casting. We just have uh, four more of them here. So I'll pull them out, try and cut them like halfway down. There it is. Should be able to pull the dagger out now. Perfect, look at that. We got a little piece that did break out there, but otherwise the mold looks pretty good. These should lock together with all this registration we cut in. Uh, the last thing I need to do is just cut a wider mouth for us to pour resin in. I can do that. I'm just gonna cut a slot like that. And you can see that leaves us with a little more room to pour. Um, I'll need more than that, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna trim some more. There we go. That's pretty good. I'll, I'll wind that a little bit. Uh, ah, I just poked myself. Ah. Um, I might wanna cut a trench up here, a vent as well, so that when I pour liquid in, air can get out. This is where we're gonna pour resin in, but as the liquid resin goes in, if it closes, if enough liquid closes this hole, air can't get out, which means liquid can't get in. So I'm gonna cut a vent in the mold uh, from as down low as possible on the mold up the side and back up to the top so that air can escape. I'd love to go all the way down to the tip, but I don't think I have, I can't really reach it. So I'll get on as far as I can. But I'm just gonna cut a small V groove into the mold. It's time to do our first test cast. So I've got my mold here, I'm making sure that it's pretty clean in there. There aren't any specks of silicone floating around. Oh, I see some in there. Looking good. Uh, I cut out some pieces of quarter inch MDF. This should be strong enough to be 
our mold wall that we can clamp it together, all pretty like. Uh, so yeah, we're ready to cast, and I'm going to first put baby powder in the mold. This will help break the surface tension on the resin going into the mold and help it capture all that wonderful detail that we worked so hard to get in the mold. Just sort of bounce that around in there. Get it to coat all the surfaces, which it looks like it has. And then we can just get rid of the excess over in the garbage. That's what it looks like on the inside of the mold there. I just wanna make sure there isn't any baby powder in the tip of the dagger. And then I have a can of air or an air compressor would work. Just gonna blast it in there, make sure there isn't any. If there's a, a bit of baby powder clumped up anywhere in the mold, when you cast resin into it, that'll turn into a void. And we don't want that. Got my mold walls here. And then I will hold everything together with some big old rubber bands. I like using rubber bands for this, they're cheap. I have lots of them. Uh, and they provide a good amount of even pressure all the way around the mold. Although for a long mold like this, I wanna make sure I put rubber bands all along the length of it. It, believe it or not, can bow on the middle when you add all that liquid weight. It'll accumulate here and balloon out, and we don't want that. For our casting, I'm using Smoothcast 300. It's a very standard urethane resin and it cures quickly. Mix those up. I'm gonna pigment this a color, probably just gray. This particular resin cures bright white and I don't want it to be bright white. It's hard to film. <laughs> so I'm gonna mix in a little bit of this black tint that will turn the final cured piece gray. If I put red in there, it would turn it pink. I'll mix the tint in with the side B because it's a little thicker than the side A. I'll do that ahead of time to make it a little easier on myself. Once I pour this in there, then the clock is ticking. YOLO. Kids still saying YOLO? I don't know. Now I guess that this is about 150 milliliters for the casting, and we're about to find out if I was right. Down the hatch. That looks pretty good. Um, there isn't a lot of sprue there, so I do want to make sure it's filled up really well. Uh, also, it will eventually fill up this, this vent over here as the air leaks out the bottom. So I want to make sure I have a lot in there. Maybe squeeze it, see if I knock a few bubbles free. That's probably good. Now, it's not necessary to throw this in a pressure pot, but I have one, so I'm going to do it. Make sure we have no bubbles. That goes in there. Please don't fall down. Putting some heavy stuff in there to keep it from falling over. Top goes on. And we're gonna bring it up to about 40 PSI. Starting now. Time to let the air out. The resin's all cured and it's time to take apart our mold and see how it turned out. Who put all these rubber bands on here? Ooh. That looks pretty good. The, uh, the resin is still, as we would call it, green, which means it's still pliable and soft. So I think I'm gonna let it rest in the mold for another, let's say, 10 minutes and then we'll pull it out. We waited a little longer, went and had lunch, and now I think we can demold our dagger with confidence, comes right out. Oh, look at that. Nice. That looks great. I can get rid of my, this is our vent. Don't need that. And we are set up to cast another one if we like. Casting turned out pretty great. This side, obviously no seam. We did not cut that side. On the other side, the seam was right along the edge of the blade. You can't really see it there. There's a little bit peeking through there that we can clean up with some sandpaper. Uh, and then there's gonna be seam lines on the inside of these parts, but even those are fairly minimal. So our quick and dirty mold worked great. Now that our urethane casting is done, why don't we drop it just like we did with the raw 3D print and see how well it fares. Okay, dropping the urethane dagger and go.
It's amazing how much the urethane bends when it hits the ground, but it did not break. Proof positive that it was worth making that mold and casting it out of urethane. Now I can cast another. I can cast as many of these as I want. So I think what we're gonna do is get fancy with some resins and make another one. For this casting, I swapped out to uh, 326. Uh, if I had 325, I'd use that because it cures a little bit faster. But this is a color match resin. So I wanna cast the whole dagger in a really neat color, and then I'll paint over a lot of it except for the beveled edges here. They're gonna be a purple. It means I need to go get some pigments or tints for my resin. Ooh, be careful. Boop. Just like before, I'm gonna mix some of this tint in with my side B. The difference is this stuff cures clear instead of bright white, so we're gonna get this really dark purple. That's so super purple in our final casting. But I'm also going to put in some pearly blue. That should give it a little bit of a, an iridescent shine. Oh, it's so shiny. Should add more. Should add more, okay, Britt. Oh, okay, that looks really cool. <laughs> now that I have my tint and that casting powder mixed in, I can mix in my side A. Uh, this stuff does have a long cure time, so I do have a little bit of time to work with it. I don't have to rush. Uh, but I am going to mix it in this cup, taking care to scrape the sides really well, and then I'm gonna pour it in another cup and mix it again in there. This, uh, this resin here, if you don't get it mixed perfectly thoroughly, you can get streaks and since it's mostly transparent, you will see the streaks and that's bad. So mix it in one cup, pour it in the other cup and mix it again and then we can pour it in our mold. And then we will also throw this in the vacuum chamber like before. This looks so cool. In you go. Just about topped off. This will go in the pressure pot. This stuff takes about an hour to cure, but I'm probably gonna leave it for at least an hour and a half just to make sure it's nice and, nice and cured. It's been about an hour and a half and the remainder of the resin in my cup is cured. I can probably, yeah, pop it right out of there. Oh, that looks really cool. <laughs> um, that means that the resin in the pressure pot is fully cured so I can pop it out of there. A little bit of leaking, that's okay. Ooh, oh, that looks really cool. <laughs> uh, it is still kind of flimsy as well like before, so. Uh, I can get rid of that guy there. That's our uh, pouring or our vent. Uh, but anyway, um, I am gonna leave this closed for a little while longer for it to fully stiffen up. This is the vent, what's left of it anyway, and you can see it's still extremely flexible. So we're gonna let this cure a while longer in the mold uh, until this is rigid enough that when I bend it, it snaps. That would mean it's fully cured. Been about another hour and I'm getting impatient, so I'm gonna take this thing out of the mold, see how it looks. Ooh, it's so pretty. It's still a little flimsy, so maybe I'll leave it out of the mold for a little while to cure, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, that's a pretty dagger. A little bit of a seam in here, so I'm just cleaning that up with this file. Got a little bit of a seam on the edge here too. This is where we cut the mold open, so I'm gonna have to clean that up a little bit with some sandpaper and files. Something I'd like to do before we move too far on the <laughs> finishing job is these screw heads, uh, I wanna replace them with real screws. So I've got a bunch of leftover screws from Nerf guns. I just collect these when I take apart Nerf guns. And uh, they look cool, they've been painted black, and I kinda want them to look a little bit neater, so I'll buff it a little bit with some uh, a scouring pad, and there's a little bit of a metallic shine peeking through. So I think that's what it'll look like in the final part, but before I attach those, I'm gonna drill these holes out so that the screw head will fit right in there. There's also smaller screws here. I'll do the same thing. I have some smaller Nerf screws over here that I'll use. To round over the edges of that hole I just drilled, I'm just using a Dremel bit and spinning it and just giving a little bevel around the edge of it there. These screws are just gonna be decorative. Uh, I don't need the actual threaded part. In fact, it's gonna get in the way. 
So I'm just using this cutoff wheel on my uh, rotary tool here to trim that off. I also have this fancy pair of pliers that holds the screw uh, coming out the front of it there, which is super helpful. There we go. Just need um, a bunch more of those. I got the seams all cleaned up on this fella with a little bit of elbow grease and some files and sanding paper. And then I went and scuffed up the entire surface with some sandpaper and a scouring pad just to give the paint a little something to grab onto. Before I spray some paint on here, I'm gonna use some alcohol to wipe down the surface, get all the dust off there, and make sure it's nice and clean. And then I'm gonna go and spray it with some crystal clear spray paint. This is a gloss that'll leave a nice shiny surface on our entire prop. I sprayed on two good coats of clear, that crystal clear. It's nice and shiny now. I uh, gave it an adequate amount of time to dry. It's dry enough to handle it. So I'm gonna move on and mask off the edges. It's all gonna get painted except for these bevels on the edge of the blade. So I'm gonna mask those off like that. And I think I want a fine edge up there, but I'll, I'll trim that later. I just wanna make sure I cover the whole thing now. I wanna trim a little edge off the masking tape there. So I've got my compass here and I've set it just about as small as it can go. And I can follow this line and draw that offset that I want. It's doing okay, it's kind of showing up. Now I just have to follow that line freehand. No problem, right? Let go. There we go. That's exactly what I wanted. Fantastic. I loaded up some gunmetal colored paint in my airbrush here and I'm gonna cover everything. Except of course the areas where we masked. That gum it looks pretty nice. Uh, there's one more color. This circle with a X in it is gonna be gold, so I need to mask that off. I just took a piece of masking tape, got a circle in it. Should be the right size. Poke it down and around that with a pen, that should work. Just go over to the airbrush and finish this thing off. It's time for the really fun part, pulling off our masking tape, carefully. Ooh, oh, that's nice. Boy, this looks, this looks so super, super clean. I may not even weather this. Oh, that looks so cool. <laughs> uh, I think the last thing to do is just glue those screw heads in and I'll be all done. This thing turned out so cool. And of course I couldn't help myself. I had to go in and do just a little bit, just a tiny bit of weathering, just to call out some of the really sharp detail on here with a little bit of a black wash with acrylic paints in there, helped it all pop out really well. I wanna thank Matter Hackers and Piopoli for sending us the Moai 200 to play with. For a prop like this, being able to print something with this fine a detail, this big all in one shot was pretty fantastic. Uh, and I had a good time doing it. So thank you guys so much. We'll have uh, information about that printer and Matter Hackers down below if you wanna go check that out for yourself. That's gonna do it for this project. I had a ton of fun doing this. I hope you had a good time following along. I wanna thank our Extra Credit Club for the support over on Patreon and right here on YouTube. You can hit that membership button, get access to some behind the scenes content, some exclusive behind the scenes content. Thank you so much for the support and thank you so much for watching. 
you want to follow along, I'll have a link to the files that Jury sells uh, for this particular dagger. And of course, all the materials and tools that I use during the project, those will be linked down below as well. Thanks as always for hanging out with me in the shop today. I hope you stick around, subscribe, hit that bell, because we got some awesome projects coming out every single week. and You don't want to miss it. I'll catch you in the next one. <laughs> what is this? Ooh. Okay, here we go. And dropping now. <laughs> I thought for sure it would shatter, but it bounced. <laughs>